what drove that first move from 10K to 60K? Well, as soon as the ETFs, $300 billion is coming in. Nope. More money will be converted from fiat to Bitcoin than the previous 15 years. You just keep thinking it's all going to work out. And then you realize, wait a minute, why am I paying, you know, $18 for a hamburger? And and why is gasoline costing $4 a gallon? And why is that plane ticket costing $700 instead of $300? That's because your money isn't as good as it used to be because they had to print more of it to fund these deficits. And they stole my Bitcoin. I'm like, what are you talking about? Today, Mark discusses how the Grayscale Bitcoin Trust, a fund investing in Bitcoin, contributed to increased demand and price appreciation for Bitcoin. He contrasts this with Elon Musk's tweet against Bitcoin, which caused a price crash. However, the Bitcoin having event, which reduced the supply of new Bitcoins, helped stabilize and eventually recover the price. Mark then outlines the different types of investors and traders in the Bitcoin market, emphasizing those who speculate on its value movements. He shares an example involving his brother, who incurred losses by utilizing leverage, which involves borrowing money to purchase more Bitcoin. Mark highlights the risk of leverage, noting its potential to trigger sharp declines in Bitcoin's price, sometimes even below its fair value. This downturn often leads to a loss of confidence in Bitcoin among many individuals. However, Mark believes that this skepticism marks the opportune moment for investors to re-enter the market, purchasing Bitcoin at lower prices and initiating a new cycle of price appreciation. This cyclical pattern underscores the resilience of Bitcoin and its ability to rebound from periods of doubt and volatility. Drove that first move from 10K to 60K. Okay, liquidity. Well, what do you mean, Mark? Well, GBTC had had just kind of become de rigueur and people were talking about it and a bunch of money went in. And a bunch of money went into a small asset and demand went up and, and we went from 10 to 60 in a heartbeat because about, I, by, by, by my estimates, about 10-ish billion an asset that was trading about two billion a day went in. And we went up. And then Elon famously tweeted, Well, we don't like it anymore. So you can't buy your Tesla with with uh with it. And I might sell some of it out of Tesla and because he had to pay some bills. Um and it crashed. And then liquidity went the other way, right? Because people were like, oh, I'm out. And so, but then by summertime. People are like, well, it didn't go away. And uh, I kind of like this asset. And the halving had occurred. And remember what the halving does is it, it reduces supply. So there are two types of things that will drive price, right? Yeah, you your supply and demand curve. You can increase demand. So if you increase demand, if you shift the aggregate demand curve, the price goes up. P0, P1 is higher than P0. Second thing you can do is you can shift supply. You can restrict supply. So if you have a demand surge, GBTC, and a supply cut, what happens? Price goes up. So, but then what happens, and we talked about this, is when the price is below fair value, investors buy. That's what investors do. They buy things below fair value. Then what happens is as the price starts to move, the traders come in. And the traders don't really care about value. They just they just want movement. So they start. And, you know, as the price keeps moving up, more traders come in, more buyers come in, great. And that actually attracts some new capital into to the asset, whatever shiny asset that is. Well, then the speculators and the gamblers come in. Well, who are they? Well, the people that come in, they don't give a crap about anything. And just a number go up, I'm in. And I'm doing with leverage. And back then, you could still get a hundred times leverage. I mean, I've told this story on the show. I shouldn't pick on my brother, but my brother called me after the the collapse and uh, said, "Hey, they stole my Bitcoin." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" He says, "Well, I put it a bit." I'm like, "Stop! You levered an eighty vol asset a hundred times. You got a margin call, 
you couldn't make it. That's not stealing. That's the way the world works. And if you had done that with, you know, uh, Cisco stock in 2000 or Microsoft stock or which actually happened or Amazon stock, you know, it went down 94 percent. Lots of people got liquidated. And that's why they're so sharp. It's this unwinding of the leverage that causes those sharp downdrafts. And so then you get all the way, you go past fair value, you go all the way down to the depths and everybody's like, oh, I hate this. It's never going to go back up. And then quietly the investors come back and that's why you have these cycles. And so where are we today? So we have, for, for equities, we had the rise and then people said, well, in, no, in November of 21, they're like, the numbers don't add up. Get out, get out. And the Fed took liquidity away. And so people are getting liquidated. And so, well, then in October of last year, what happened? They actually increased liquidity. They didn't cut rates. But if you look at liquidity measured by cross-border capital and others and, and the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index, we're loose, looser today than any time in the previous 10 years. And so that massive wave, and part of it was China and, and a bunch of other things. But, but the bottom line was liquidity flooded back in and the gamblers are back. And the short sellers got squeezed. Short sellers, since October, lost about $185 billion trying to be short the Magnificent Seven because they're looking at these things going, these things are growing single digits and they're going up double digits, triple digits. Doesn't make sense. But if you try to short something that is in this mania phase, you will get taken out. And I won't necessarily compare NVIDIA to MicroStrategy, but go back to 2000 and look at MicroStrategy's chart. Started $3, went to 100 they carried out all the shorts. Then it went to 200 they carried out all the shorts. Then it went to 330 something and everybody said, oh my God, it's going to the moon. And then went right back to three. And they get fined by the SEC and a bunch of other stuff. But the reality is when it breaks, it breaks hard. So flipping from equities, I think the double top in equities, right on, perfect analogy, I would be very skeptical of, of holding U.S. equities here. And the forward-looking returns are, are very low. Bitcoin, on the other hand, we're just getting warmed up. The halving is three months away. That supply shock is real. And we had a little hiccup in the last couple of weeks because everybody thought, well, as soon as the ETFs, $300 billion is coming in. Nope. We got five. That is a lot. But we didn't really get five because GBTC made a decision to keep fees high. So, so they lost roughly an equivalent amount. And so we haven't had the net inflow yet. And those you know, open that low, Almost a billion. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it, which is great, which is great. But that billion is going to turn into 10, is going to turn into 30. And I, I'll stand by my statement. I believe in 2024, more money will be converted from fiat to Bitcoin than the previous 15 years. That's a big ass statement, but I believe it. And it's because most of the increase in the market cap of Bitcoin is not new money. 